The Tom Woods Show, episode 1120, bonus episode. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I have been a guest on several different podcasts lately, and I thought I would share one of them with you in case you'd like to hear it. And because it's a business-related podcast, I thought I would make this into a bonus episode. I've done several of these lately. I did, even though I'm not a musician, I did Musicpreneur, which is a neat podcast hosted by our friend James Newcomb, who's been a guest on this show. I was on again, on this time on the Nathan Frazier show with Nathan Frazier. We talked about business stuff. And then finally, I was just on, and this is the episode I'm playing for you, the Six Figure Grind podcast, which you can check out at sixfiguregrind.com, hosted by Kevin Geary, who's been very successful in his own right in the fitness and nutrition realm. And we had a very good conversation, I think, very interesting. And we kind of went behind the scenes of what it is that I'm doing here. We looked at how it's possible to build something that you can run as a business from a laptop and that sort of thing. And he asked me a lot of questions about how it all works and what all the moving parts are. And in case you haven't heard that story from me yet, or I'm sure there's something in here that's new to at least some of you, I thought, here it is. Here I I lay it all out for you. So I hope you enjoy this. Check out Six Figure Grind. It's a neat podcast. I'm going to link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1120. And off we go. All right, welcome back, Grinders. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Tom Woods. He is a successful entrepreneur. He runs TomWoods.com and HappyEarner.com. He's authored 12 books and is a New York Times bestselling author. He's the host of two very successful podcasts, The Tom Woods Show and Contra Krugman. And he's he's just been a real big inspiration for me, both in terms of business and in terms of advocating for liberty and free market economics. I can't recommend his work enough. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. So when did you become an entrepreneur? Like, when did all of this start for you? 2010, I left a regular salary and went off on my own for family reasons. We just, we weren't happy where we were living. We moved somewhere else, but in moving somewhere else, I wouldn't have the regular salary. So I'd have to do a lot of public speaking, which is what I did. And I traveled all around the country like a nut in order to earn enough money to support what at that time was four children and later became five. But it just was no way to live. I just couldn't keep up that kind of pace. And it never dawned on me to actually create something. I just I was still in the mentality of you sit by the phone and you wait till somebody calls because they need you for something. You don't proactively do something or create something or market something. And then somebody I know well who's very smart when it comes to marketing said, you've built up a brand for yourself over the years. I mean, I had uh, New York Times bestselling books. I had a substantial following. I had a lot of views on YouTube. Why don't you monetize that? Why don't you do something with that? Why don't you? And and my, my response was, well, I use the Amazon affiliate program on my website. <laughs> like that was how I was monetizing it, you know, enough to earn lunch every day. And the guy just put his head in his hands like, I can't believe I'm dealing with this guy. And he said, think about what it is you offer to people that they like. And one of the things they liked was that I have a somewhat unconventional take on U.S. history. I think the way you learn it in the typical fifth grade textbook is just a crime. It's just it's just shocking. It's propaganda. So I, you know, I, I smack down stuff like that. I, I can create courses in which I teach it the way I think it ought to be taught or economics or related fields. And he said, why don't you do that? Create things like that that people like and market that. So I opened libertyclassroom.com in 2012. And it was me and other PhD folks that I trust. And that's how we marketed it as the history and economics they didn't teach you. And that has been just phenomenally successful, even though with most things that you want to market, there's a, there's a pain point that you're trying to address. Right. You know, let's say I can't make money online. So you have a pain point. That's a pain point. You address it. What's the pain point in th- in this product? I don't know enough American history. I mean, that's not much of a pain <laughs> that's point. What, so, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. This product should not work. 
In fact, uh, there's an email marketing expert out there named Daniel Levis. I did a one-hour consult with him. He insisted there's no way this product should work <laughs> and couldn't get – and I, I get it. I, I understand. But it does work. It works really well. So that was my first th thing where I, I said – instead of just sitting by the phone waiting, that's the moment I think that you change when you no longer have your fate in somebody else's hands. And I mean to some extent the th because you're catering to consumers, your fate is always in their hands. But I mean – I wasn't waiting for some employer to call me. I now had something. It wasn't the, the last thing I created, but it was the first thing where I could say, this thing is mine. It's a continuity program that generates an income stream that can go on for a long time, and it allows me to live comfortably. And then I, then I realized, hey, there really is something to this whole work for yourself thing. So what was the pain point? Like, did you talk to like, – what do people say when they buy it? Why were they buying the course? Well, some of them – this was coming off the the um, energy of the Ron Paul presidential campaigns, and a lot of people felt like hey, this was our brief moment to shine, mm. and they also felt like they're surrounded by – you know, there's one of them and 99 of their Facebook friends from high school who are saying to them things like, but without antitrust laws, monopolies will gobble us up. And I understand why people think that. I, I, I would be shocked, absolutely shocked if anybody thought otherwise based on what we read in, in 11th grade uh, U.S. history. I would be shocked. But, that's, but it's not true, and that's not the point of our conversation today. But that sort of thing, they wanted to be able to defend themselves. They wanted to be able to say, look, I have good reasons for what I believe. And it's hard to defend what I believe because I can't sum it up in a bumper sticker, and it doesn't appeal to your emotions. It's strictly and mercilessly logical, and I don't know how to answer every single argument, but I want to be able to because I believe in, the, I believe in this idea that at the very least, we ought to give the benefit of the doubt. Before we just assume that we need to be herded into some collective, let's give the benefit of the doubt to the possibility that free individuals can solve problems. And before and, – until we are absolutely convinced that we can't through really good arguments, not just lazy assumptions, I want to go with that. And so it's hard to defend that position because you're not trained to believe that in school. And so I'm giving them that ability to be able to st stand up in a crowd and knock everybody down in a nice way. I mean, I'm not trying to humiliate people, but they've seen me in videos or, or other faculty members. They've, they've seen us take on multiple people at once with objections and answer them in ways that, you know, even, even impress the people asking the questions. And they say, well, I want to be a superstar like that. That's fascinating. So uh, you're thinking about building this course. People are telling you, uh, this, this is not going to work, Tom. Uh, don't, don't like touch this with a 10 foot pole. Uh, what, how did you just break through that noise and say, ah, I'm going to do it anyway. Was it just, there wasn't any other ideas? Well, first of all, it, it was, my own ignorance helped here because it was only later that people had the guts to tell me they okay. didn't think it was going to work. You know, it's sort of like the person who goes on American Idol, who's a <laughs> terrible singer, but his friends, not one of them, they're all saying to each other, are you going to tell him? <laughs> and, and not one of them does. And then on, on American Idol, it gets exposed how terrible he is. Well, I had a, something like that, except in my case, figuratively speaking, American Idol worked out. It worked out. You had auto-tune or something. It's all right. Right, right, right. All right, cool. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you about, because um, this is uh, it's it's really inspiring to me on one level, but on another level, it irks me a little bit. It's the fact that you make like online business look so easy. You make it kind of feel effortless. Is, is that what's really happening behind the scenes? Oh, my gosh. I worked so hard on that product. First of all, that was just killer <laughs> to, to create. There's more than you think there's going to be with something like that, like creating a membership site. It's annoying. Yeah, there's a there is a learning curve. But the the nice thing is it's a lot of upfront work. It's like a podcast, for example. Um, the podcast has a lot of upfront work. Like you got to you got to come up with you know a little graphic icon, just things you wouldn't even think of. You, mm -hmm. you know you have to you have to learn how to record on two. I like to record on two separate tracks. You got to figure out which microphone to use and how to set it up. And you don't even know what a boom arm is. And so there's a lot at the beginning. But once you if you can just have the willpower to plow through that the beginning part, then the rest is a lot easier because now certainly with me I can speaking for myself I can say I'm in a really good groove with my podcast it's an easy routine every day to do it because I got through that initial thing so with this membership site oh yeah you got to learn membership site software and and troubleshoot and you got to create the content and you're pulling your hair out and you're 
you know, crying yourself to sleep and <laughs> whatever. But once you get through that, once you have a digital product, the beauty of it is it's there forever. It can fulfill the orders automatically. I wake up in the morning and people have been buying it while I was asleep. That, but so it's easy now. It's easy after I put all the work into it. It, it, really, it really gets to a point where you say, this is almost not fair how easy it is. And the other thing is I've gotten good at promoting the thing. I've got, I mean, that's just, that's it. Now I, I'm not as good on Facebook as I should be. And I'm going to be working on that to get a, what, what I want to have is a regular campaign that, that runs in the background that I'll change once in a while, because there is a, a number on Facebook that tells you how often the average user has seen your ad. And once it gets mm -hmm. up to like four, like, you know, four times per person, then you really need to change the ad. It's getting stale. People really are, are tuning it out. But the idea there with Facebook would be you, you use Facebook, you, you, you uh, pinpoint your audience and you start bringing in leads every single day to your free course that then leads to an email autoresponder series that that leads them to sign up for the whole thing. And and that's that's a way to just keep it going in the background. But the thing that I've gotten good at to promote it, though, is not so much trying to draw new people from the outside, but taking my current audience who are already convinced that I have something to say that they want to listen to and saying, all right, look, this is my flagship thing. I mean, you, you think you like my free content. Wait till you see this thing. And I've built up an email list that I every year appeal to at Black Friday weekend time. Mm -hmm. And I've got an email sequence that, well, I, in fact, this year, I would say I probably reused 75% of the emails from the previous year. A and I just ran them through just to see, are they still going to work? Exactly the same emails that I sent to promote this thing the previous year. Will they work? And I had a six-figure result, and all I had to do was send some emails over the over that weekend and they were emails i wrote you had already written year. yeah yeah insane because it turns out most people have lives and they are not <laughs> carefully studying your emails from a year ago they they're all fresh to them and you so, have a bunch now, of new people on your list since last year too yeah that's right so that helps so so now this year i'm going to do all fresh emails i just can't bring myself to do it three <laughs> years in a row but the point is if you know what you're doing with email that really is the thing. The problem is most people make two mistakes with email. One, they don't email often enough because they're afraid people will unsubscribe. People will unsubscribe. But what you what you really want, I like what email expert Ben Settle says. I want people on my I want people who feel either hot or cold about me. Mm. I, I don't want the lukewarm. And and he quotes from Revelation about I will vomit you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. I want hot or cold. And this way, I get people who are only just hot for what I have to sell, what I have to say, who look forward to my emails every day. So that's the mis first mistake is thinking you shouldn't e – the more you email, the more money you make. That, that is just – that's an absolute fact. The more, you, the more money you make. But the second thing is it depends on how you email. If all you email is you know, subject line 50% off today, no one opens that. And if your whole message is, I have this great, awesome thing, you're going to love it, it's 50% off, it just doesn't work. You'll get open rates of 1.3%, and that's going to be it. So you, you got to figure out a way that entices them to open. There's got to be something oddball in it or off the wall or interesting yes. or, or a story or something that compels them to open, and then you transition into your pitch the same way – Talk radio has a pitch. I mean, you, you talk radio, you enjoy it for uh, 20 minutes, and then they go to a commercial, and you don't say, how dare they go to a commercial? You say, well, they got to keep the lights on. So no one's going to – nobody you would actually want on your list is going to mind that you have a pitch in your email, but that's what you do. It's what Ben Settle teaches, infotainment. Yes. You get a little info or a little story or some, some kind of thing or it's just some tidbit or something, and then you transition that, – it's that all-important transition into your product. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it took me so long to figure that part of it out that, that you have to be an entertainer first. Like you can have all the great information in the world, but if you just dump information on people, it's not going to work out. People want to be entertained. And so like one of the uh, analogies I've used is I've told people to be the, the magic school bus, like of their industry, right? Where you have this cartoon that is highly entertaining. It's entertainment first, but it slips in like, education and information into it and it, it captivates you know the kids who are their audience but um it's it's the, the be entertaining first is the probably the biggest lesson that i missed for years and years and years i was like oh people just want they just want great information they want great content well 
most of what great content is, is the entertainment piece. That's what really makes something great content. Yeah, exactly right. And especially when there are, there's so much competition in that inbox, right? There's so much stuff coming in and you've got to make sure that yours gets read. Now it's hard. I mean, uh, Ben also says not to obsess over open rates, obsess over sales. What matters is that you're making sales. And, um, and so that's that's definitely worked for me. But the key thing also is that if you get good at it and you're consistently known for sending good emails, then you can slightly you can obsess slightly less over the subject line. Although I kind of do. I want subject lines that just compel people to open them. But once in a while, if I don't have the world's most clever subject line, I know that. The important thing, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, is actually not the subject line after a while. It's the from line. Right. If it's from Tom Woods, they say, all right, that's a stupid subject line, but I know it's, there's going to be something worthwhile in here, so I'm going to open it. I mean, it's part of their routine. They look, they look for your email, and they open it, and it's just, you know, gives them 30 seconds of enjoyment in their day. No, and I can vouch for that because I'm on your email list, and I was going to tell people, look, if you want to know uh, a great example of how to do email marketing, you need to get on Tom's email list, and we're going to talk about how to do that at the end, I'm sure. But first, like you've, that's exactly happened to me. Emails from you have shown up and sometimes I don't even read the subject line. As soon as I see it's from Tom, I just open it and I read it because I also know that it's not, it's going to be quick, you know, and it's going to be entertaining. It's not going to take a lot of my time. So there's not right. a huge barrier to, you know, like some, sometimes, and when I talk about email frequency and people ask me how long should your emails be, I kind of feel like the more often you email, kind of go the shorter route. Because if you go with really long form email, like uh, Ramit Sethi uh, does really long emails a lot of times. And if you did that every day, it, it kind of would become a burden for people. Like even though it's interesting and useful, it's like, man, that's going to take a lot of time. Maybe I'll just wait. Right. On it. People will put it off and then they'll end up not opening it. And you know, the thing is, I follow two people who have completely different styles when it comes to email. And they're both extremely successful. So it, it does matter. It depends on your personality. But I already mentioned Ben Settle. And he'll have an email like about the secret marketing tactics of the, the actor Steve McQueen. Mm. Now, Steve McQueen doesn't even know he has these tactics. Ben figured it out by <laughs> watching them. It's these sort of oddball kind of topics that he draws a business lesson out of. But then on the other hand, you have the guy McGraw-Hill calls America's best copywriter, Bob Bly. Now, Bob writes extremely straightforward emails about, you know, here's a – how to start a copywriting business or whatever. And it's, you know, sincerely, Bob Bly. Totally straightforward, but I have to open his emails too because there's something valuable in there. The key thing is just feeling like there's something valuable in what somebody has to say, and you, you want to get to that point. So I want to go backwards just one more time to the tech stuff that you talked about because you said if you can just have the willpower to, to power through this like early, you know, learning learning curve – then it's going to get easier and easier and easier as it goes. Were, were you doing all of that tech stuff yourself? And were you techie at all before you started trying to take all this stuff online? Yes to the first question, no to the second. I was doing it on my own. I was figuring out audio editing and stuff like that. And the thing is, when I launched the podcast, I was in the middle of the most harrowing project I've ever done. So even though I knew I had some audio stuff to work on, I literally had no time to, to do it. And now, and, and the thing is, I didn't outsource stuff at that time just because I felt like I didn't have the money. Now, I did, I think, but I can understand. I'm not going to reproach myself for that because at the time – I, I didn't know that this was going to be a go, and maybe this would be throwing money down a rat hole. I just didn't know if I should do that or not. But now outsourcing has has helped tremendously. But secondly, not even outsourcing on a permanent basis, but just on a trial, on an initial basis, getting somebody to help you get set up to get over that initial hurdle really is worth every penny. So, for instance, right now – I am slowly but surely moving away. I have a PC and a Mac, and I really would like to be podcasting on my Mac because I just enjoy using it more. But the idea of trying to learn new software and figure out how to record on two tracks on a different kind of uh, operating system and everything, I just – I'm exhausted even talking to you about it. <laughs> so I just – Looked, I, I realized, wait a minute, here's a guy who does it. He runs a, comp a podcasting company, and he, he uses a Mac. And I thought, look, if I paid this guy 100 bucks to sit down with me for half an hour and set it up, you realize how worth it that is? The aggravation I would avoid, the days and days of experimenting and going through tutorials. I, I've gone through my last tutorial. I want some guy 
do it for me. It saves me time, saves me uh, aggravation, and I can be doing stuff with that, you know, what would have been foregone opportunities at the time that I would have spent doing this. I can be doing much more lucrative things. It, it, it's, a, it's a hard hurdle to get over because I know that when I used to make a YouTube video, it would take me all afternoon to do the editing and put in the, the, the little the website in the corner and all that. And I could have paid somebody 50 bucks at most, and they would have had it done faster. They would have had better quality. And I could have been working on stuff during those hours, but I felt like I don't want to blow 50 bucks. And I get that, but at some point, you got to start doing the math and see if maybe spending the 50 bucks and taking the cheap way out is actually the expensive way when you look at it from a bird's eye view. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you, it's valuing your time. And if you're going to charge, let's say you're doing strategy calls or coaching or something, uh, and I don't think you do any of that stuff, but if you did and you were going to charge, you know, $300 an hour or something, $400 an hour, it's like, why are you then? spending time doing a $20 per hour task. Lots of time on a $20 per hour task. That doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You're right. But that's a huge hurdle for people to get over. And I think what you hit on when you said, I didn't know if all this was going to work out. Like, am I just throwing money down a drain? I think that's the way so many beginners look at it. And that's why they get stuck in the mode of not outsourcing. And sometimes, as I say, because especially with online stuff, a lot of times the bulk of the work comes at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. If you get bogged down in that because you won't or feel like you can't ask for help because you don't have the money or you, you, whatever, you're still in this mentality of I've got to save every penny, even though you're actually costing yourself by spending all this time on it, then they don't get past that hurdle. They never, they never get started. So whatever you need to do, I mean, if you have to save up 500 bucks, however long that's going to take you, just so that you'll have a budget to get people to help you, if that's what's going to take to get you over that hurdle, that will be worth every penny to you and many multiples uh, of that you know, a, a year from now. I love it. So when you stop doing uh, small tasks like that, it opens up the door for you to spend time on stuff that really matters, that's really going to move the needle in your business. So what are the top like three channels or priorities or tasks for you for keeping your business moving in the right direction? Oh, that's good. Well, uh, number one is I have to continue producing my regular content, uh, which means the podcast gets done five times a week and then our second podcast contra krugman is once a week so that's just non negotiable well it's i wouldn't say it's non negotiable uh, there'd be a time every once in a while where i would miss an episode and i would be extremely apologetic and 99% of my listeners would say why are you apologizing you're giving us all this content for free we know you have a family and things come up i just wish i could be 10 episodes ahead all the time you know and then it wouldn't matter but i just haven't been able to make that work. I really want to. That's my goal. Every once in a while, I do that, and boy, does it feel great. So I, I'd like to do that. So anyway, release the regular content because that means every single weekday, there's some other thing out there. Because I do a YouTube version, even mm -hmm. though I don't understand why people would listen to an audio podcast on YouTube. But if they won't use iTunes, I got to give them some way to listen. So I, I do that. But the point is there's some searchable thing I created each day that is another way for people to find out about me and is another way to promote the things I'm doing. So, so that has got to be done because I, you also want a reputation for reliability. You want people to know that come what may, I'm going to get this thing from this guy on this basis uh, regularly. But what would the, the other two things then would be a little bit, okay, the second thing is I want to email as regularly as possible. I, it used to be every single weekday and on sometimes if I'm promoting something, I email on the weekends too. Uh, now it's, I, it just depends on my schedule with the, the kids and stuff. Um, I, I don't know a lot of daily emailers who have five kids, so I'm not going to be shamed by them if, <laughs> it's I tough. Miss, if I miss one once in a while. But generally on that, um, I try to get to the beach. I'm in Florida. I get to the beach once a week. I sit on the beach. I do all my, I have two email lists. One of them is where I kind of teach the business stuff that I'm doing. And I try to do all those emails in one sitting for, for the week. And I just bang them out. Now, I can't think of all the subject lines at once because that, that takes me some real thinking. I think about that on the drive home. But I just do that in one day. So the emails is the second thing. Cultivate the existing audience. Make sure that they are remembering me, that they're, you know, they're that getting that thing in the inbox. Because every when I promote Liberty Classroom during the year, you know, I get a few – I mean, I, I get subscribers just through people hearing about it on the show. The email doesn't 
give me a flood of subscribers, but it makes them think in the back of their minds, this sounds like a pretty good product. So then when Black Friday comes and I have a big sale on it, the it's just an avalanche of sales. But I've been cultivating that through, through emails uh, all through the year. But the third thing is, though, build the audience. I mean, what else could it be? So, so first, it's produce that content and just come what may. You've got to keep on doing that. Secondly, uh, contact your existing audience. But third, you've got to expand that audience. So that means, and I've been a little bit lax on this, but it does mean boosting occasional posts uh, you know, with Facebook ads for, to particular audiences. If I do an anti-war episode, then I'm going to target people who like antiwar.com, stuff like that, uh, to get more people listening. But also just build up the email list because they're on the email list. They'll find out about the show. And that means releasing more free content. I, I just I, I repurpose my content. I take I've got all these episodes. I have transcripts already being created of the episodes for people who donate to the show. And those transcripts now are material that can make up an ebook because I could take all the episodes I did on healthcare, for example, and release an ebook on that. And then when people go to get that ebook, they wind up on my email list. So I do that regularly. I've got one almost ready to go. I have a second one for this year in mind that I think will definitely build the list big time. But expanding that audience, the bigger the list you have, the more successful you're going to be. So you're constantly thinking about what can I be doing to build that list? I like I, – there's a tool I have because I have the super deluxe version of lead pages where I can get up in front of an audience and say – Something like, um, if you would like to learn about, oh, well, let's say healthcare, for example. Everybody was debating healthcare. Mm -hmm. You can text the, if you make it into one word, healthcare, you make that into one word. If you text that word to 33444, you automatically get delivered to you my ebook on healthcare. It's, by the way, it's called Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Healthcare. I, I really am very proud it. of that. I title. love it. Yeah. So, so anyway, but the point is that. I can say that in if I'm giving a speech somewhere and I'll have an audience, let's say there are 300 people in the room. If I told them, now listen, when you get home, I want you to go to my website and click on, okay, yeah. few will, not many. But if I got them right there and I, secondly, I say something very unusual to them. I say, I don't want you to put your smartphone away as every, every other speaker told you to do. I want you to take your smartphone out. And I, so right away, they thought, oh, well, who is this guy? And then I say, I'm going to give you – I build up the book in their minds how great it is. And I say, I'm going to give it to you right now for nothing. All you got to do is – here's what I want you to do while I'm standing here is text the word healthcare as one word to 33444. And I watch them do it. And I, I will get 150, 200 new leads in just instantly, instantly from just being able to do that. So technology doesn't hurt either. Yeah, it's amazing. And you know, I, I, I've been to conferences and I don't, I can't remember, uh, anybody really doing that. I'm surprised people aren't using it more. I hear it all the time on podcasts, but you would think that more and more speakers uh, would have caught on to that by now. Yeah. And, and it, because they haven't, it makes me look like some kind of tech wizard. How's he <laughs> doing that? Oh my gosh. He's, and so it, it makes it seem like I'm this phenomenon, you know, with a giant team working with him and all that. And I do have a bit of a team, I suppose, but I think because I've learned all this stuff, it does make me look maybe, I don't know, bigger than I really am. I don't, I don't know. So you, I, I knew you moved to Florida, but I didn't know that you wrote your emails on the beach. You're, you're actually like the guy in all the stock photos that everybody wants to be with his laptop yeah, on or, the beach. Or, yeah. Yeah, or everybody wants to murder. I, I'm not quite sure <laughs> which one. But yeah, I, I literally do that because for a while we lived in Heaven Help Us, Kansas for six years. And so I I grew up on the, the, the coast, or not on like on the coast, but I grew up in Massachusetts. It, the beach was easily accessible. And I just like being near the water. I enjoy that. So the fact that I, even if I was unproductive on the beach, I would do it anyway just for the principle of the thing. But it's incredible to me how, especially I... I go to Melbourne Beach in Florida. Now, don't go there because I like it the way it is. It's quiet. <laughs> nobody bothers me, okay? I don't understand why nobody goes to Melbourne Beach, or at least on the off-season. Like, Because in Florida, there almost is no off-season. So in September, you should still be going to the beach. October, you should still be going to the beach. There's almost nobody there. And it's amazing how much I get done. Maybe it's because I realize that the temptation to do nothing here is extremely great. Mm. So I compensate for that. But yeah, I just wanted to be able to say, I'm doing this. I'm living life on my own terms. And I got my little hotspot. I got my computer. And, and then 
and I just bang it out. And, and I'm just, you know, I, I don't want to take phone calls. I don't do anything. I just want to bang out these emails. Yeah, I do do that. Now, not, I haven't done it in a while because we actually had some cold weather. Uh, January this month has not been beach weather really, but you know, in a couple of weeks I'll start doing that again. And it's, it's great to just, because I think the way I've been doing it lately, just because I haven't, I, I moved to a new house and I'm just barely getting by right now because of all the, the annoyances of that, but is to do a podcast episode, then to sit down and write an email, then to try to work on building the list. Whereas I should be doing one of those things one day, one of those things another day and one another day, just bang them all out together. It's more efficient. Just batching them. So, yeah. so do as I do, as I say, not as I am currently doing. Well, let's talk more about that because that, that's really the whole point of this podcast, Six Figure Grind, is that the goal of, uh, for me, helping people and the goal for them eventually is to build a six-figure online lifestyle business. It's not to build the biggest business. It's to build a business that serves you as much as you serve it. You know, It gives you the location freedom. It gives you the time freedom. Whereas a lot of people start a business and it just becomes another job for them and they hate it and it, it sucks the soul out of them just like the job that they left did. Um, and I want to avoid that for people. And the idea of being able to go to the beach and kick your feet up and write a bunch of emails and make a lot of money I mean, that's something that is super appealing to people. But I wanted to ask you more about like what what is your and I know you're you're doing the move stuff, so that adds a lot of complexity and stuff that you wouldn't normally be doing. But once everything is situated and in place, like what would a typical day look like for you? You have five kids. What are you doing, you know, just on a typical day? Well, this is how I have been doing it like the past week or so, uh, let's say, is um I probably start like really start in working around ten in the morning. Before that, I I read the news. I try to stay up with what's going on. I read articles. I want to stay informed because that's part of how I deliver value to people. And then I start recording an episode or two in the morning. I have a I usually have my lunch in front of the computer. I read some more. Um, I have dinner and I have dinner with the family always, but but I have lunch in front of the computer. And then in the afternoons, early afternoons, I write, I bang out a couple of emails. I, um, I, I look around for what affiliate products am, am I interested in promoting that are actually decent, that can help the people I, uh, who listen to me. So I get that set up. I give people assignments like I'll say, okay, I need a landing page done for such and such. And then by 2 to 2.30, I can legitimately say I've done enough for the day that I can stop if I want to. Now, I in the old days, I would have thought, oh, my gosh, it's only 2 or 2.30. Let me start 12 more projects because <laughs> I've, I've had people say to me, look, Woods, you could do this. You could do this. You could do this. Here's a business that'd be great for you. Here's a business. And they're all great ideas. But I've spent so much time in my life working beyond the normal amount of, of time that now I want to work less than the normal amount of time to make up for those crazy years when I was frenetic. And I've just placed, I place a very high value on having a lot of leisure time. So after that, I go down and I go over, um, I look at the kids homeschooling, for instance, uh, maybe we swim in the pool or, uh, I, I read a book. One of them is, you know, still, still, not learning how to read, but learning to become a proficient reader. And so we'll sit and read together or we'll go out and do something interesting together. And maybe when, you know, maybe after 1030 at night, if there's something that really needs to get done, I'll pop up to the home office and work for another hour. But th that's it. I'm really not doing the, I want to start 12 more projects. It's because the current projects are working really well. And, and what I've done to get to work so little is not that I'm doing less. It's that other people are doing more for me. Mm. And then I focus on building up the audience so that other people can, can be doing even more valuable stuff for me because we have a bigger audience to do it for. That's the thing. I've gotten – it's taken me a long time, but I've gotten to the point where other people are doing stuff that I don't need to do. I even have somebody who manages my email. I never, ever thought I would give the keys to that kingdom to anybody. But I've got somebody managing my email who will send me things that are urgent for me to see. Well, I, I read everything that, that listeners send in. I read it. Mm -hmm. But but in terms of uh, if, it abs if it does not absolutely require a response from me, it'll get a response from my assistant. And so this way I can keep an eye on what's going on but not get sucked into I need to send 50 emails every day. Because I am accessible. If you go to – I have a private Facebook group. There are ways of finding me. 
but I just can't answer every single email that comes in because I've decided I'm going to, I'm devoting my life to my kids. That, that, that's what my life's devoted to at this point. If you want to come ask me a question, I got a Facebook group and I'll do my best for you. So that's really it. And, and as I say, I've had a major, major change in mentality where I have all this extra time, but because the money is really coming in and shows no sign of slowing down, and that's what makes me comfortable, then I don't feel the need to open two more businesses, even though I could, and even though I'd be three times richer. I wouldn't really be richer in, in I know this, boy, this, I sound like a, a Lifetime Channel movie. I wouldn't be richer in what counts. No, but that's, that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly the message of the show. So that's, that's absolutely perfect. So let's close out with this because I know we're coming up on time. There's a lot of people out there listening who this is still just a dream for them. And they hear a lot of stories like this and they probably think, yeah, it'll, it'll happen for Woods. It happens for Kevin. It, it doesn't happen for people like me. What words of encouragement can you offer them before we close out here? Uh, well, first of all, you are still getting in on the ground floor. Eventually, people are going to realize what a gold mine the Internet is. But amazingly, even though they understand that as an intellectual proposition, they haven't really – internalized it. They're not acting on it. They're still digging ditches, as this is the expression I use. They're out there uh, with a job like it's 1957, but it's not 1957. It's 2018. And what you need, it's, it's shocking how little you actually need. What you need is to, to do is three things. Now, okay, it, it can be tricky, to get started with the three things, but at least you know what your battle plan is. The three things are you need to find an offer, which means you either need to create something that people would want to buy, which is the hard way, or you find somebody else's offer and you just earn commissions on it. And if you're, if you're doing digital products, you can earn 50 to 75% commissions. So you find an offer. Secondly, you find an audience that would be interested in that offer. And these days, there are tools like crazy to, to match your offer with an audience. I mean, it's there are tools out there marketers of 30 years ago would have s slit the throats of their own grandmothers to get hold of. So, the, so find an offer, find an audience to pitch that offer to, and then rinse and repeat. And that is it. Now, so that involves building an email list of your own. That's unavoidable. Like people will try to tell you you don't need a list. There are ways you can promote stuff without a list, but you can't scale those ways. Uh, the, the, there is no substitute for building an email list. So you can find resources online. How do I build an email list? Just type that into Google. You'll have enough reading to last you three years <laughs> if you want. So, so that, but that is the thing. So it could be golf. It could be, it could be fitness, but there are a million people in fitness. You've got to find some super duper concentrated niche in fitness, whatever it is that where you have some passion or you're interested in, or you have some knowledge to share or whatever, or, or even you could just pose as Mr. Average guy who is learning along with his readers about something or, you know, like uh, I've seen good blogs about I'm learning Chinese right alongside you. So being being Mr. Regular Guy is also a perfectly fine persona. Uh, people would also want to follow. But that is what almost everybody I know online does, other than people who have e-commerce stores, which is a totally different strategy. That's what they do. So start thinking that way is what I would say. Awesome. All right. So before we close out, just let everybody know where they can find you. Plug whatever you would like to plug. The, the floor is yours. All right. Probably, I'm trying to think of the best way to do it. I have two different email lists, and I use these tactics. <laughs> tactics makes it sound like I'm trying to manipulate people. I really am not. I really am trying to deliver people something they like to open and then be able to tell people, look, it has these great results. You know, I want to show you how to do this. I, by the way, I like the idea. I have people who write to me and say, I already own everything you have. Right? I have a, there's nothing you have to offer me anymore. But I like your emails because of the information and the entertainment, but also because I feel like I'm learning how to do it. And I, I would not have bragged about this before until I had a really class A copywriter come on board with me for a project we worked on together where we were going to write emails together. And he wrote some emails, and they were fine. They were very straightforward emails. And I said – I want your emails to be more like this. And I sent him one of mine and he wrote back and said, okay, so you mean you want like master level class a copy all the time? <laughs> and, and I said, wow, you mean I'm that good? Like I didn't know. I, I didn't, I thought I was okay, but I had this guy say, no, no, you're pretty good at this. So another reason to read them is that it does show how you take entertainment and you sell with it. So 
the, the, the one way to do it is I have a page on my site. It's a redirect, tomsfreebooks.com. Get any one of those books. Uh, all but one of them will put you on my libertarian email list. There's another one on that page about how to make a living online. And that, but it's taken from, it's not speculative. There's no theory in there. It's all taken from exactly what I do, whether having a podcast or self-publishing a book or selling products as an affiliate or freelancing, all those sorts of things are all covered in there. So that book will put you on my entrepreneurship list. So if you want to get on both lists, get, you know, get, get a libertarian book and get, get that one. And then you'll be on both of them. And, and I think, per- personally, I think people should be on both of them. So uh, I'm going to put all of the links to all that stuff in the show notes. Um, that's it. Tom Woods, everybody, thanks for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. All right, Grinders, I hope you got a lot out of that. I want to thank Tom for coming on the show and sharing so much valuable insight and, and wisdom related to this. He's been in this game for a long time now, and he's seen a lot of stuff, and he's partnered with a lot of the top players, so he absolutely knows what he's talking about, and I'm glad he was able to take the time to just come and share that stuff with us. All right, everybody, if you want to join that email list about business ideas and tips and tricks and products and whatever – then the way forward is to get my ebook on five paths to an online income. You can get that at pathstoincome.com. And I think you'll enjoy reading the emails. The idea is that even if I tell you about something that you're not interested in, let's say, uh, you know, something you're not interested in buying, you still you'll enjoy reading it because there'll be something interesting or funny or insightful or whatever. That it'll be 30 seconds out of your day that you open it up and you get some enjoyment out of it. And that's what I'm shooting for with these. So anyway, check it out at pathstoincome.com and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.